Oh my lord. Round two. I'm gonna try this again. Uh, hi guys. I hope you are all doing well. I am struggling this week. Uh, that's well, I'm, I'm not there because I got the COVID. Um, I got it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I ended up getting major symptoms starting um, through uh, winter break uh, on Monday through like Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday I noticed, um, or actually that Saturday and Sunday, I was coughing a whole bunch and... Um, but like, like a soft cough, like an easy one, you know, and I was like, oh man, I got a cold, you know, like I'd already lost my voice kind of going through the week prior and I was like, yeah, I got a cold, this sucks. And then, um, on Monday I like, I was like, okay, cool. No more cough. I'm solid. Like my, my upper respiratory problem in my nose and mouth is gone. And I was like, this is great. Um, and we're getting ready to go to Gatlinburg and I realized I can't smell anything. Um, and when I say I can't smell anything and I realize it, it's because I'm changing my one and a half year old, almost, well, yeah, one and a half year old daughter's uh, diaper with a whole bunch of poop in it. And I had no idea that there was poop in it because I couldn't smell. And I was like, what a glorious world to live in. I had no idea that not being able to smell was so awesome. Like, this is the best thing ever. And uh, then I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute. Why can't I smell anything? My nose isn't stopped up. I'm still not stopped up. I can I can put air in and out of my nose through ninety percent of the day or less, a little less. Um, but why can't I smell? And I mean, there's only a few reasons in the world that you can't smell, right? Uh, and one of them happens to be COVID. So. Uh, by Wednesday, when I developed a pretty harsh cough in the middle of a winter storm in Gatlinburg, and I hadn't gone anywhere, I was like, I just stayed in the, the cabin room or whatever. I was like, okay, winter storm's coming. I got this bad cough. I can't smell anything. I probably have COVID. We need to go home. So we packed up and came home Wednesday uh, afternoon. It's only like a four-hour drive. And uh, scheduled myself a COVID test for Thursday uh, afternoon went and did it and within minutes of that uh, the rapid test the nurse was coming out there telling me I was positive and she said if it's that quick it's not good uh, and that's what the medical community calls super COVID so yay for me I guess we gotta get out of the screen and I'll get to what I'm actually supposed to be talking about um, so yeah anyways I'll be back the next Monday uh, I won't be contagious at that point I promised some people I would wear a mask in class from now on because uh, apparently you can get COVID more than once. I'm an example of that. <laughs> uh, so that may have to change. I really don't like that idea. I got out of the medical field for a reason. Um, not for wearing masks wasn't one of them, but it's just going to remind me of days past. Oh, well, poor me, right? Um, what are we doing now? Well, you guys just covered the Middle Ages, and I'm kind of jealous. I, I like the Middle Ages. I mean, who doesn't like knights, you know, crusades, King Arthur, Camelot? Like, oh, whatever. I missed out on that one. Oh, crap. I feel a cough coming on. I'm sorry. Hold on. <coughs> I apologize. Um, so yeah. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're moving on from the middle ages and we're building off of that. And I, I made this little pyramid chart thing at the top of these guided notes to kind of, um, illustrate some things. One that these timelines that we're doing and these, these ages and periods and whatnot that, and events that we're discussing, they, uh, they're not just a, a linear timeline. It's boring with dots on it. They actually can be like molded and, and made into something. And see, we've made a pyramid here. We're, we're building on things. Uh, we have all the events that follow and surround the fall of Rome circa or around 300 to 500 uh, CE, right? Um, and those events are the, the migratory patterns of uh, the, the Goths running away from the Huns and, and all those kingdoms that they make, the, the Visigoths and Ostrogoths and 
the Lombardies and whatnot. And the decline of the Roman economy due to those migratory patterns and their lack of, of taking care of their public works, right? All those things that we've discussed before that caused the fall of an empire, they all just kind of fit in this box. Also, everything that you discussed with the start of the Middle Ages and, and Charlemagne and his lineage that uh, creates these monarchies and these kingdoms in, in Europe also can fit into this box. But let's not forget North Africa and the Middle East and the Ottomans and the Byzantines and all of that and the Constantinople and all that business and the Turks. That's all going on right in here, right, with the rise of Islam, which fits inside the Middle Ages. And then we're going to add in another one today, the Renaissance, okay? And the Renaissance is... <sighs> Really, if we were to travel back in time, if we grabbed ourselves a TARDIS or a time machine, you know, we talked to Jules Verne and we're like, how'd you do it? And we, we get in the time machine and we go back to 1320 in the, in the, in the, um, the 14th century, right? So 1320 or 1360 in the 14th century. And we walk up to um, a, uh, a Venetian in Venice or a, a Floridian. Flor no, no, that's a Florida. Floritian? Whatever is in Florence. I don't know. Florence, Italy, right? We go to Milan. They're, they they don't consider them Italian. They're like their own little bitty area, right? Like southern Italy is Naples, the kingdom of Naples. When we go up to a Nepali, Napoleon, Napoleon, Neapol, I don't know. Somebody from Naples. And we're like, hey, what time period is? They'll say, well, my sir... It is 1364, the year of our Lord, you know, and you're like, oh, but like what period of time is it? They're not going to, no one's going to say the Renaissance. No one. That, that word isn't even going to be like, it might have been in some writing of some fancy guy. He's like, oh, it's a Renaissance of the arts, you know, and what does that really mean? Well, a Renaissance is like, it literally translates into rebirth. It just means that it's a revitalization, it's a rebirth, it's a, it's a, we're bringing it up again. We're bringing it up, what are we rebirthing and bringing up again? You know, like, what, what, what does that even mean? Like, why would someone say a rebirth, a rebirth of what? Well, the Middle Ages was also called the Dark Ages, and that's because, well, as you guys have already discussed, Europe went into turmoil, like the plague, we don't know how to read and write anymore. People are drawing, like, drawings that look like a kindergartner did it. Let's, okay, yeah, actually, speaking of, let's, let's pull that up real quick. This is the art of the Middle Ages. I mean, two-dimensional. This looks like a kid drew it. Like, I don't know. They, they, they forgot, right? They, they forgot. We went from the Greeks and the Romans and all that aspiring art and sculptures to this. And a lot of what they are doing is religious focus, but it's also dark because the plague, right? So the dark ages. Well, we leave that and we, we get into the Renaissance and that's where we're gonna see a rebirth, a, a restart, if you will, to Europe's artwork. Where are they going to get all the ideas? Well, they're going to get it from the people that haven't had any problems at all. Yeah, good old Islam, the kingdom of Islam from North Africa, mainly Constantinople. Like Istanbul, Constantinople is really going to help out with this. They've got all the secrets, all the art, all the science, all the medicine. And Europe is going to start trading with them again. And uh, we're going to see a whole lot of money pour into Constantinople and a whole lot of ideas and art and whatnot come out of it. And it's all leading to the 1600s or the 17th century where we're going to see this thing called the Reformation, which is, oh wait, the 16th century, my bad. 1500s through the 1600s is the 16th century, which would be the Reformation. Uh, and that's going to be an interesting thing that we're going to get to maybe tomorrow or the next week, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's what this chart's about. I want you to realize that the ideas that we've been discussing for the previous two to three weeks, they compound on each other and, and they're all leading to this point called the Reformation.
big springboard into modern world history and well buckle up people because it's artwork time this is basically what the renaissance is about it's about artwork that's the only thing that really has any common bits to it you would think that i would figure this out by now all right here we go so uh i don't know what city this is that we're looking at in this pretty picture i'm gonna guess it's northern italy and Maybe somewhere in Milan, or it might be the city of Florence. I don't know. I have to ask my wife. She's been to Florence. I haven't. Um, you know, I want to bring that up real quick. I don't talk about how I've traveled to Europe because it's like, oh, look at me. I'm cultured, high and mighty. I've traveled. Bow all to me. It, it's actually more along the lines of, I want you guys to know that little old country folk from Oklahoma like myself or uh, the Georgians around here, you know, uh, us, us Atlanteans, you know, you don't got to be rich to travel to Europe. There are ways. Take and, and look around. Take the opportunity if you can. Travel abroad. You'll not only have an amazing time because of the food and the people, but you'll also learn a thing or two. And um, it'll make you a better person. And I just want you to know it's possible. Anyways. So yeah, um, in that that uh, handout that we were just looking at with the, with the pyramid, right? It's not gonna look exactly like this because I'm gonna tweak this and put like your name on it and I don't know some other lines, but uh, it also has this chart in it. it. Says Renaissance, humanism, secular. Yeah, that mirrors to this one. Wow, look at that. I, you know. Made it a little easier for you. I'm going to leave it on here so you have a chance to uh, fill this stuff in. We're going to come back to this chart. We're going to leave and come back. Okay? That's how this is going to work. So uh, while you're writing, I am going to talk. Hopefully you can hear me. I am now standing up. Um, so that way, I don't know, I feel more uh, teacher-esque instead of sitting in that stupid chair. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the Renaissance... We just said earlier, rebirth or restart or a revitalization, a, uh, a redo, whatever you want to put in there with re, right? Um, and what are, we, what are we redoing? What are we rebirthing? Like what's coming back around? Well, what's coming back around is the classical and oh no, oh no, Rob, you done did it. Uh, the classical Greece and Rome. Is there a way I can make a pointer? I'm pretty sure I can. Ooh. Ooh. Laser pointer. Yeah, all right. So yeah. Classical uh, classical Greece and Rome. We're going back, guys. We've already talked about them before. We brought them up over and over and over again. They're going to keep coming back over and over. I don't, I'm, I don't think you'll ever be done hearing about Greece and Roman world history. So here they are again. Uh, we're going to look at how artwork is going to uh, change from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, and it's going to change because they're going to start mimicking the Greek and Roman artwork again. Um, and these guys are going to come out of that, and they're called humanist or humanism. Now, you'd think like humanism, like oh, they focus on like human beings and science and like and trying to learn about the human body. And it's it kind of true, but not really. Only, only a select few of them are. Um, mostly, what this is about is looking at people and their achievements and paintings and sculptures, rather than the religious aspect of things. So the Middle Ages, we were we were painting. Uh, uh, saints and priests and a few battles here and there, or maybe some knights, you know, nobody cared about the peasants, right? Nobody painted the peasants and nobody really like paid attention to the detail of the people. It was more telling the narrative and the story and the legend of whatever the event was that we were painting or sculpting. Instead here, these humanists are going to look at the detail of the human body. They're really going to, try to encapsulate what the human body looks like in a painting they're gonna they're gonna really sculpt in those ribs in the sculpture or they're going to 
pay attention to the way the cheekbones and the ears and the the um the measurements in between to see that they're anatomically correct anatomically correct right like so anatomy is the study of structure and structures relation to each other has nothing to do with how it works so when you're studying anatomy i don't necessarily care how it is that the breathing mechanism of the respiratory system works i care about that the right lobe has three lobes and the left lobe has two lobes and that's because the left lobe encapsulates the heart right see how it's the relation of structures to each other and and why that they're they're shaped the way that they are in relation to each other that's anatomy anatomy in itself is just an art form it's 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 just studying art like like or structure architecture even mechanics uh well not necessarily even mechanic actually scratch the mechanics because um mechanics would be how it works and that's physiology uh so yeah, this artwork is going to be very much about the anatomy. It's going to be about the structure. And literature is going to follow a similar, uh, a similar move as well. And out of that, uh, it's going to develop this um, idea of secularism. Secularism or secular. When someone says that something is secular or it's of secularism, it means that it's concerned with the current topic at hand or the here and now, as this chart says. So if we were to discuss uh, um, secular religious beliefs within or secular religious beliefs if we're just as a whole, like if I said, OK, class, we're going to talk about secular religious beliefs today. What that means is when we're discussing the secular religions of Georgia at this present moment in time, the state of Georgia, or Atlanta, or South Paulding High School, very localized and currently. If I said we're going to discuss Christianity as a whole, well, buckle up because it's going to be about 2,000 years worth of history and we're going to be talking about uh, the valley of jordan and and uh and israel ancient israel and the israelites and the hittites and the egyptians and blah 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 blah, blah. a whole bunch of other stuff that has nothing to do with you and i right now except for it goes back two thousand years worth of history right it's not anything to do with the here and now which that's secular history okay and what's going on is these humanists because of their focus of the people and their their achievements achievements are current right it's what they've done right now it causes a secular movement concerned with the here and now and and because it goes into literature as well as the arts literature literature would be the main thing everybody is reading which would be the bible and just about everybody who's reading the bible has to read it in latin or greek because that's the only language that it's put into because of the way the churches work right because you guys looked at that the catholic church or the roman catholicism they print they have priests write not print they have priests write and rewrite and copy the bible in latin and then your are constantinople eastern orthodoxy christian church they do everything in greek and uh they copy the Bible in Greek. So everybody that's concerned with literature is reading this one book and they're all reading the same language. Suddenly though, we're concerned with the here and now and that's local, right? So what does that do? Well, that takes the idea that I really am concerned with people in say Milan or even smaller in the city of Florence or um, the kingdom of Naples and I want them to read the Bible. Well, they uh, they want to make the Bible important and they want them to read it. So they need to do a bunch of things. One, they got to get it out of Latin because not everyone reads Latin. Only the rich people read Latin. And they got to make it important to the poor people too. So um, how do they do that? Well, it's through making it popular. And the only way to make things popular is to, to look important and, and to be... Um, better than everybody else and you do that through mansions and clothing right and 
um, who are these people call, called that are are promoting this humanist secular movement? Well, they're called patrons. A patron is someone who pays for uh, goods or service, right? They like if you think about Patreon. Um, Patreon is a uh, um, a service where you pay someone online for what they're doing. Like if I had a gaming channel on YouTube, which I don't, but if I was cool like that, uh, then I, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm distracted. Um, if I had a, if I had a gaming channel on YouTube or if I had maybe like, a, an art gallery, I could get on Patreon, um, and people could, uh, pay me for my service as a gaming person. Like they'd pay money in Patreon and that would then give me money to continue on making my content for my YouTube channel. That's how Patreon works. Well, a patron at this time is a person who supports artists or these humanists in creating artwork and literature that are of the Renaissance period that is concerned with people in a local area, right? So, like, these people right here, the Medici family. The Medici family is a rich banking family um, in uh, Florence, Italy. Uh, they're a banking family slash a family who is granted uh, the only mining rights to a, um, a particular uh, dye that everybody wants for their clothing, their expensive clothing. They're the only ones that can make the dye in Europe. Medici family are rich. Um, they mine that uh, this ore that uh, it gets crushed down and makes this purple dye and uh, then they dye uh, fancy fabrics uh, mainly I mean it's wool you know that's uh, it's imported from uh, England and France uh, from sheep right you, you shear sheep to get the wool well they uh, they dye it this fancy purple clothing for rich people and it's expensive and then they make a lot of money off of it but they also import through trading um, trade routes and that are guarded by the kingdom of Naples and through trading cities located nearby called um, uh, Venice and Genoa Genoa is where Columbus is from by the way which we'll get to him later um, but those those trading uh, centers they import silk and other fancy fabrics from Egypt and China um, and India. And then they, this family dyes them the purple color and then sells it to everybody and then makes a lot of money. And they also take that money and create a bank to loan out money for people to do things like go to war or buy a villa or a mansion or whatever, right? You see how this is all, all of this is connected. You can just start drawing lines. Like, don't really draw lines because they make it really messy, but you understand what I mean. The Medici family are um, patrons who are concerned with their local area of, um, of Florence, which is a secular movement in humanism, which comes out of the rebirth of classical and Roman uh, artwork, and that's called Renaissance. Now, this is... The Medici family lasts for like six generations or maybe longer. So you could see that this idea lasts a long time. And and really none of these people would say that they're part of this. But looking back on it, if you were concerned with just the rich people and the information that comes out of there, which is information would be anything written or painted, then you could see how we would classify it all together as the Renaissance. I have been on this for a long time. And I think that you have it wrote down by now. So let's move on uh, and we'll come back to that. So what is this artwork really doing? Um, we looked at uh, the Middle Ages. Uh-oh, I think I have it on this one. We looked at the Middle Ages artwork and we saw that it, it's very simple and two-dimensional, right? Well, what happens in the Renaissance artwork? Well, let's see if I can actually let's find. Oh, you know what? I have pictures that I got. I forgot. Okay, we're going to come back to the Mona Lisa. Pretend you didn't see that. Uh, okay, so go back in time with my travels. Um, this is Rome, Italy. 
in particular, we're going to leave Rome. Like right now, this, this road right here is the city of Rome. But see this door? Yeah, that's into a place called the Vatican. Maybe you can make that out. It says uh, Vatica, Vatica, Vatican, 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 I don't know how to say that, but Vatican, the Vatican. So you go through here and you're no longer in Rome. You are now inside the walls here in the city of the Vatican or the, the country of the Vatican, smallest country of the world, tiny. Um, that right there is St. Peter's Basilica. That is, uh, the church where the Pope is the cardinal of and like the main church of all the churches of the Catholic Church. So when you say the church, it's that one. Uh, built during the Renaissance period um, from good taxpayer money. Not really taxpayers, but tithe. The tithe, which you guys talked about. That's what it's paying for is this thing right here. And all of the marble that you're going to see, all the white marble that's on this thing, it all comes from the Colosseum. So the Colosseum has no white marble anymore, which is kind of sad. All right, inside of the Vatican is the Vatican Museum, which is where we are. And these are Greek and Roman statues, in particular this one right here. You should recognize this guy. He is none other than Julius Gaius Caesar. Yeah, Roman statue, Julius Gaius Caesar in the Vatican. Now you can see how this is all going to tie together, right? Um, here we got some buses, which are heads, sculpted heads. And this guy right here... This helmet, I hope you might recognize if it was bronze and he was holding a spear that's like 40 feet long or 8 feet long and he's got a shield. Yeah, this is this. This is a hoplite. It's the head of a Greek hoplite. Um, it's all inside the Vatican Museum. Uh, this guy, uh, this is none other than my man Hercules with his uh, big wooden club and leather, or not leather, leopard skin uh, tunic. And uh, he would have been naked in all his form and glory when the Greeks carved him. Uh, but um, uh, um, interestingly enough, the, so the Greeks carved him. And this is actually, this, this would be anatomically correct. Um, but the, it's the Vatican, right? So the, it's Catholic. So they got to be in their modest sense. So they take and cover all, they chop them all off and cover them all with fig leaves. So everywhere you go. All the naked men, yeah, covered with fig leaves. Interesting. But everything else is anatomically correct, per se, right? And this is the Greeks who did this, but the, um, later on, the church is going to get a hold of them and do that to it, right? But out of those, uh, well, I'm, this is, should be later, but out of those, we're going to see uh, Renaissance sculptures to mimic this and paintings to mimic this idea of anatomically correct. Um, this is a Venetian gondola. These are like lamps, like oil lamps. And uh, so this is, you know, you have your guy with a pole and he'd be singing you some song and pushing you through Venice. It's all romantic like right now if this was modern times. Back in the day, this is how you got around in Venice, uh, which maybe we'll look at on Google Earth later. Um, oh, yeah. So here we're actually getting into like the Renaissance era artwork. Um, well, I mean, look at this dog, how detailed that is. That's Amanda. Amanda Jane, my wife. Um, so, yeah. Um, the, uh, the sculptures in here, I mean, just look at the detail of this goat, like, and then horse there, there's a unicorn somewhere, uh, I think, yeah, maybe around the corner, I don't know, there, like, that's a, um, like a minx, oh, there's the unicorn, <laughs> the unicorn's my favorite, uh, national animal of Scotland, do not make fun of the unicorn, I will hurt you, so yeah. This is, uh, this is pretty cool how detailed their artwork is. Oh, there's my man Hercules again. And um, I think that's Athena. And I, one of these is Claudius. Yeah, Claudius, Emperor Claudius right there. The man, the legend. Um, so those are all still Greek and Roman statues, but the animals are Renaissance era. So you can see the detail, right? Now let's look at some paintings from the Renaissance era because that's all I could find. So this one right here, it's called the rebirth slash the thanksgiving. Um, it's really the thanksgiving, which is what this means. It means like uh, something about thanks be to man or thanks be to him. Give thanks. Um, it's a, I think they won a battle. I don't know. I don't know. But you can like, this guy's got a, 
um, a turban on. So he must be from Constantinople and Turk. And these guys are all in fancy clothing with purple, right? So they are from Europe, probably from Italy. Look at that purple uh, tapestry on this tent. That must be important. And there's a rainbow in the background. All good things happen with a rainbow. In particular, at the end of this is pot of gold, right? So yeah, you can see how, I mean, look how detailed this is in comparison to Middle Ages artwork. Like just super, super detailed. And it's just all over the place inside the Vatican. Um, this right here is the, uh, oh man, oh, the Sistine Chapel. Not Sistine Chapel. Oh my God. What's the one in England? Sistine Chapel's in Paris. We're going to look at it in a minute. This one is Westminster Abbey. You guys can make fun of me later for getting that wrong or just blame it on the fact I have a cold. I have COVID. That's what it is. So anyways, this is Westminster Abbey in London. Um, and uh, the inside of it is glorious, but I can't take pictures. But this is coming out of the Renaissance at the very end, going into, well, no, at the very end of the Renaissance. So yeah, you can see the, uh, the Greek architecture coming in, kind of. Middle, middle Ages architecture, really. So this might actually be the beginning. But this is still, same stuff. Um, here we're in Paris, and you can see the columns. Now that definitely is Greek, right? Columns are, are a Greek thing. So this stuff is all Renaissance into, um, into the later period we'll get into with uh, called absolutism. Um, that'll be just in, what is that, the 17th century? Um, but these guys right here are definitely reminiscent of the Renaissance. And these are obelisk like you find in Egypt, right? The Romans had obelisk all over the place. So that's why they started making these all over France with the idea. Same thing here. You got more columns. Uh, and then like the Greek looking statues and all the little minarets. And, like these guys are called cherubs. They're little baby angels and they're very anatomically correct and whatnot. Uh, this is the Louvre, probably the world's largest treasure of Renaissance artwork. And look, you got a pyramid even in the Louvre, a glass pyramid. Uh, oh, here we go. Sistine Chapel before it burned. Look at all those. This is very Middle Ages, uh, but you can see, like, I mean, they're getting to the idea here. Little, little golf. Middle Ages. Same thing with uh, Westminster Abbey, but the artwork inside each of them is Renaissance. Uh, so, yeah, here we go. Very live like, very pretty. Um, artwork of the Renaissance. Um, here we go. These are, these are, you know, it's the hoplite, right? Greek, but it's painted in the Renaissance. And I mean, just look at the detail. Gorgeous. Look at this castle in the background. It's great. And the spears. Uh, I don't know what that says. It might say David. This is David. That's crazy. They didn't have castles like that. That's the Middle Ages. But whatever. Oh, here's the lady, the legend. Okay, we're talking about the Renaissance. You can't talk about the Renaissance without talking about Mona Lisa. And this is my wife's picture of the Mona Lisa. It was very hard to get this. It's super zoomed in. We're like way in the back of this crowd. But I have a present for you guys. There she is, Miss Mona Lisa in glorious detail. Look at that. I mean, yeah, she just follows you. It's creepy. I hope this looks as cool on the monitor for you guys as it does for me right now. It's so creepy. Yeah, this is painted by none other than uh, uh, Da Vinci himself, um, which is in the PowerPoint. Let me let me get back to the PowerPoint because we have to be on the PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, the, the detail, perception, and these lines, what they're representing is the idea that these paintings have a foreground, which is up here, and a background, and that everything relates to each other within a relation of the, um, the center focal point where the painting is. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the middle. It could be over here, but the distances are all relative to each other, and things are proportioned, and they're real looking realist um so yeah perspective matters and that's what we're getting out of there we also discussed how it affected um literature and we talked about that word secular remember let's go back to that. oh right there so secular right concerned with the here and now so if i was a church leader 
Or if I was someone rich and I wanted to convey an idea to people in the here, the here local, right? And now I couldn't do that using a foreign language like Latin or Greek. But if I use, say, uh, Phoenician or um, not Phoenician, that's a Greek word. Uh, that's not what I meant. Uh, I was thinking about Florence. If I used Italian, Italian, like Northern or Tuscan Italian, or if I used uh, French, or if I used uh, German, or if I used Spanish, right? Any of those languages. I think this is Italian, maybe? Uh, I don't know. I can't tell if it's Italian. I think it is. Um, but if I used any local language, right, then I'm using my vernacular. Vernacular means local language. Uh, then I can be secular in mind using my vernacular. Ah, see how that ties together? Okay, so vernacular is local language. Vernacular is a local language. Okay, put those together. Secular vernacular, moving on. All right. Um, yeah, so you guys could see here that like this picture is showing that artwork that I was just looking at. And the church leaders, right, they're getting the idea that if they can make this opulence, this realistic, if they can bring the ideas of the Bible into local language and make them look like local people and real, like this, that uh, suddenly these, these concepts that they're trying to teach about heaven and hell and how you should pay your tithe and how you should um, behave in the manner that we're telling you and you should come to church, and follow our word and our word matters that they can control the population and make the population feel the the realism of it they can actually make the bible more than just these latin words from a foreign language into something that is tangible that they can touch and read with their own words and they can see in pictures painted on the wall and suddenly let me get out of this you get Things like this. Look at how real this guy looks. This is in Northern uh, Europe. I think this is like a Germanic guy. Uh, but, I mean, God, like that could be a real picture. And the, the thing is, is that uh, they do this with people from the Bible and famous monarchs. And they, they tell stories with it. And suddenly, these saints and these king, kings and emperors of the past become real. It becomes something someone can see and visualize and remember. And now the story means more. And now they have more control. I just That's just insane. I know it kind of looks like uh, Alice in Wonderland sort of style. But it still is more realistic than those Middle Ages ones, right? Um, and I mean, just look at her. Crackling paint aside. Don't, don't, she looks lifelike. Ugh. All right. So, yeah. I'm just saying it's crazy. Um, Mona Lisa. Painted by uh, Da Vinci. Michael, or not Mike, uh, Leonardo Da Vinci. And he... I thought I had that up somewhere. Mm, I guess I don't. Well, painted by Da Vinci. It's the most famous painting in the world. Most people are going to recognize it. It was painted sometime in the beginning of the 16th century. So 1500, 1500 and change, 1503, I don't know, somewhere in there. And uh, it's a half-length portrait. What that means is that like it doesn't show her, her legs or anything. Right? It's just the upper half. In fact, actually the painting was cut at one time uh, to fit inside of some fancy frame. Which is just the fa the frame meant more to him than the painting did. That tells you something. Um, it was eventually purchased by um, uh, who's it like? It's King France, King of France, King Francis the first. Um, and uh, that's probably where it gets popularity. Is the fact that it, that this this King of France owned it, and you guys have just seen how powerful France becomes in the Middle Ages. Um, it who is this? Lisa, Mona Lisa. She's uh, Lisa Giordani. Giordani? Yeah, Giordani. Lisa Giordani. I thought I had that up somewhere, and I'm sorry. I've lost it. But her name is Lisa Giordani. 
Uh, she's married to uh, this noble lord, Francisco Giacondo, Giudani, I don't know, something like that. Anyways, uh, but really nobody, honestly. That's who Mona Lisa is. She's nobody. The reason she's famous is because she was owned by this monarch of a really powerful king, and he really liked it. So everyone else really liked it. Eventually, the uh, Republic of France gets it in like 1709. Remember that date, because it's not the King of France anymore, or the Kingdom of France. It's the Republic of France in 1709, 17, early 18th century, right? Yeah, that matters. They've had it ever since. It's in the most famous museum ever, the Louvre. And it's really hard to see. Just take it from me. Um, let's see. So yeah, Middle Ages people believed that uh, the denial of worldly pleasures would happen to make God happy, right? So in the Middle Ages, being miserable was good. Because everybody was miserable. But in the Renaissance, that changes. And that God's pleasures in the world, so having fine, finer clothing... Um, and finer foods and, and better houses and that kind of thing, mansions or, or castles or whatever, that, that God intended for people to enjoy those things. So you actually see Europe uh, where they try to explain away the fact that, well, your priest and whatnot need to live a life of simplicity to now, well, why do the priest have the fancy red clothing? That, by the way, is provided by the Medici family. Uh, well, because God intended for us to have nice things, right? See how the, the narrative changes with who's in power? Um, so how did the Northern Renaissance differ from the Italian Renaissance? Um, well, we looked at, actually, that right there. That was a good example. So this is Northern paintings. Uh, so this Mona Lisa started in Italy, ends in France. France is kind of Northern, uh, Renaissance technically, but... Starts in France with a with a French. I mean, uh, starts in Italy. Sorry, starts in Italy and then ends in France. France is kind of northernish Renaissance, and Italy is the southern Renaissance, along with the lower part of Spain and um, and Greece and whatnot. Those are all southern Renaissance, mainly Italy. Italy is the southern Renaissance, and then France and Germany are the northern Renaissance. Uh, the idea, though, what I'm trying to get at is that Da Vinci is an Italian renaissance painter and you can see how this is painted uh with the lighter colors abstract background of like the landscape isn't really that detailed um and then like long flowing uh whatnot without making this art history anyways and this is like her veil at the top is abstract now look at this guy dark background on purpose very detailed very crisp you don't see that pastel, whatever. And we can also see the shading. See how like this light shading, but it's kind of like um, softer, not softer. Like could be a picture. Still has that thing like where the eyes follow you around. I wish I could like move. Oh, I can't. I wish I could move his head around like I do Mona Lisa. But yeah, those eyes would still follow you. Um, but this is Northern. Okay, so there you go. That's the difference between the two. Um, but it's more realistic, more emphasis on, on the society. Notice we were looking on a changing society. And that changing society idea will play into the Reformation that we'll discuss later. Uh, they all build on each other, right? So, um, what reason do these humanists give for wanting to reform? There's another re in there, right? So, rebirth, renaissance, reform, they all mean change. What uh, what reason did the humanists give for wanting to change things? Well, we just looked at it before. They wanted people to live Christian lives. What better way to make people live Christian lives than to tell them the story in their own language where they can read it in their own words, their own vernacular, and to make it very, very realistic and memorable by giving them paintings that they can tell. And I mean, I will forever remember this stuff. Like... This is, this is just, how do you impress somebody? Well, border everything in gold and paint it really pretty. <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, and, and, and the, the idea that you need to give up greed and corruption and war to provide for education and women and children comes out of this idea. Now, it's the rich elite women and children. So, like, the Medici family, 
the women, most of the women are the bankers. They're the ones doing all the money and work. While the men are learning like philosophy and, and, and politics and that kind of thing. And they're governing and doing that sort of thing. And that's sort of how that works with the rich families throughout the Renaissance, all through, and all the royals too. Um, but women, women end up do, they do learn how to read. Um, and that, you should see that through the Middle Ages as well with the women uh, being able to uh, somewhat understand how to read Latin because they're taught and then they actually are the ones currying Christianity and helping it to spread and become as powerful as it is. It's actually a women's doing that. So yeah, that's the end of that uh, longer lecture than I intended. Let's see how long this ended up being. Oh, 45 minutes. Well, it's not terrible. All right, guys. Well, I will see what's up for you. I'm not sure. I'm going to look at that now. I should have planned better. Uh, I didn't know how long the lecture would be. So I'm going to look at see what's going on. But uh, I'll see you guys Monday. Um, at least half of you, I guess. The half I have. And uh, I hope you guys had fun with Mrs. Hicks and the Middle Ages. Because, I mean, I was certainly looking forward to it. She built it up big for me. And I got nothing out of it. I'm sad. Um... Have a good day. See ya when I see ya.